death wouldn't bother him. After the first death, he said, there is no other. Pity the living who will last alone. The dead in Hades have their host of friends. Well, whatever he is, and somehow it can't be Hades. You can bet that Dylan has his host of friends. Standing among them, brave and bold, talking with the best. Occupying the only true position, as he said once, for an artist anywhere. Upright. I was born, he wrote, in a large industrial Welsh town at the beginning of the Great War. An ugly, lovely or so it seemed to me town. Crawling, sprawling, slummed, unplanned, jerry-villered and smug suburb by the side of a long and splendid curving shore. Never was there such a town, I thought, for the smell of fish and chips on Saturday nights. For the crowds in the streets, for the singing that gushed from the smoky doorways of the pubs in the quarters we never should have visited. Another world where with my friends I used to dawdle on half holidays along the bent and Devon facing seashore, hoping for gold watches or the skull of a sheep or a message in a bottle to be washed up with a tide. One afternoon, in a particularly bright and glowing August, some years before I knew I was happy, we set out together to walk to the worm's head. We reached the spreading heathered common. Down there is Oxwich, the ash white of the road, the green and blue of fields and fragmentary sea. Laughing to each other on the cliff above the very long golden beach, we pointed out to each other the great rock of the worm's head. Tomorrow we would bathe and throw a ball on the sands and stone a bottle on a rock and perhaps meet three girls. To walk and shout by the sea in the country, throw stones at the waves, remember adventures and make more to remember. We crossed over on slipping stones and stood at last triumphantly on the windy top. There was monstrous thick grass and we laughed and bounced on it. At the end of the Hampton serpentine body, more girls than I'd ever seen before cried over their new dead and the droppings of ages. This isn't like any other place, I said. I watched the sea slipping out with birds quarreling over it and the sun beginning to go down. Patiently. Oh, yes, yes, I knew him well. He used to climb the reservoir railings and pelt the old swans. Run like a billy goat over the grass you should keep off of. Cut branches off the trees. Carve words on the benches. Pull up moss in the rockery. Go slip through the dahlias. Fight in the bandstand. Climb the elms. Light fires in the bushes. Oh, yes, I knew him well. I've known him by the thousands. And that park grew up with me. A bit of bush and flower, bed and lawn in a snug, smug, trim, middling, prosperous suburb. I discovered new refuges and ambushes in its miniature woods and jungles. We knew every inhabitant of the park, every regular visitor, every nursemaid, every gardener, every old man. We knew the hour when the alarming retired policeman came in to look at the dahlias, and the hour when the old lady arrived in the bath chair with six Pekingese and a pale girl to read aloud to her. I think she read the newspapers. But we always said she read the wizard. The face of the old man who sat summer and winter on the bench looking over the reservoir. I can see him clearly now. He saw them clearly till he died. This seaside town that was his world. The lady and the policeman and the old man, all 
the shadows from childhood past have gone. Oh, happy. The chrysanthemums and the daisies are there. Different? All the same. Who knows what strange dreams and colored visions still abound in Kum Donkin Park for those who alone have the gift of sight. It was Dylan's wonder that he kept until the end the intense vision of a child. And when he died, maybe it was that the child within had begun to cry because there were no more secrets. From Swansea town and the splendid curving shore, he drew his threads together and from them wove his boyish dreams. And I came to the shops and houses of the uplands. Here and around here it was that that journey had begun of the one I was pursuing through his path. To five, Coom Donkin Drive, where on the 27th of October, 1914, he was born. Here, in the warm, safe island of his bed, with sleepy midnight Swansea flowing and rolling round outside the house, he dreamt his dreams of Bible black and dark green seas from which, in the end, he wrote his poems. Written for the love of man and in praise of God, and I'd be a damned fool if they weren't. In the still room, the future spread out beyond the window. Over the park, crowded with lovers, messing about and into smoky London paved with poems. There was a young fellow from Wales who came up there telling his tales. He says, don't get shirty, because some of them's dirty. Ha! You learn them in all the best jails. London, and all too soon he was the center of literary activity. Which means when you were young, the right pubs, and later the right flats, and later still, the right clubs. A young man who rollicked and rumpused and shocked who believed that music hall songs could be good poetry. Let us hope that in the future, when the battle flag is furled, that men and women get together. A young man who knew all too well the possible results and financial rewards of poetry writing. Writing of limericks, vast market, little or no pay. Poems in crackers. Too seasonal. Poems for children. This will kill you and the children. Poems on lavatory walls. The reward is purely psychological. Someone once said, like an unmade bed. 